Hello class, uh, thank you for joining me virtually. This week we are talking about the works of Franz Kafka and the genre of flash fiction, otherwise known as short fiction. Um, so Franz Kafka was born in 1883 in Prague and he is a German speaking writer. Um, he's regarded as one of the most important, if not the most influential writer of the 20th century um, and for great cause. Um, a lot of his writing deals with realism on one hand and then the fantastic on the other. So you might have noticed in reading some of his flash fiction that he starts by describing ordinary situations and then it sometimes finds its way into another realm. Um, one of his most famous works is called The Metamorphosis and that is a story of a man who wakes up one day in the form of a cockroach, right? So you have the, um, the plight of a working man and then juxtaposed with what it would be like to have been transformed overnight and having to deal with the anxieties that come with that change. Furthermore, something that's really important to note about Kafka is, um, and this is probably one of the most important reasons that made him so influential, is that his writing deals with an age of anxiety. What do I mean by that? Um, at the end of the 19th century, you had the um, religious ideals, and specifically Catholicism, coming more to a halt. And um, it was the beginning of the end of religion being the most important tie between human beings um, and their ways of understanding the world. So a lot of his work encapsulates what happens when man has to find value has to find answers from th something outside of the church um, and finding that if you can't find it within yourself it might not exist so let's dive in um, when you look at the first story children on a country road it begins like i said just in reality describing what it's like to be a young person in the country um, and what I find the most interesting in this piece is his use of dialogue. Um, if you look on page 380 in the packet, um, or about, you know, a few paragraphs down if you're looking at the online um, links that I gave you, you see, um, nothing was lost. We ran to the front of the house. Thank God, here you are at last. You're always late. Why just me? Especially you. Why don't you stay at home if you don't want to come? No quarter. No quarter? What kind of way is that to talk? Um, so in this way, instead of having the dialogue being separated by um, lines, he puts them all together to not only save space, but also to show what dialogue between children might look like. And then he goes on to have um, the tricks that they're playing on each other and, you know, running down the hill and um, coming home for dinner and making fun of each other. And what I really like about this story is the way it ends, right? They'll, and notice that the um, dialogue here is separated by line breaks. There you'll find queer folk. Just think, they never sleep. And why not? Because they never get tired. And why not? See, it's repeated. Because they're fools. Don't fools get tired? How could fools get tired? And so the most interesting thing about this piece of flash, flash fiction is that he spends this entire, you know, three pages or so um, creating this world of children at play and then um, leaves it kind of open-ended -end, by comparing them to fools, but then also giving them this kind of vitality that never ends, right? The idea that fools never get tired, um, which is kind of interesting. Um, following that, we have the trees. Um, for we are like tree trunks in the snow. In appearance they lie sleekly and a little push should be enough to set them rolling. No, it can't be done, for they are firmly wedded to the ground. But see, even that is only appearance. So this one reads very much like a poem. Um, so a question I would have for all of you at home is, why do you think he wrote this as a paragraph? And why would he consider this to be a piece of short fiction rather than a poem? Do you think it would work better as a poem or do you think it works perfectly as it is? Just a couple of things to think about. Um, 
The next one, clothes, um, is really interesting because he spends all this time talking about the details of taking care of your clothing and then also in this time period where having multiple things to wear is a sign of class, right? So if you're someone who is a commoner and you are um, wearing the same clothes every day, that says something about you versus the women in this story who are spending all of this time making themselves up and then going out to parties, right? And then at the end, um, he says, only sometimes at night, on coming home late from a party, it seems in the looking glass to be worn out, puffy, dusty, already seen by too many people and hardly wearable any longer. And so in context, you think it, the word it on that line is referring to the clothing, but what's really interesting and masterful about what he does here is he uses the word it and based on the previous paragraph, you might think he's talking about the woman's face, right? So what makes this piece really effective um, in the genre of flash fiction is that it leaves the end to be open-ended. You don't know whether he's talking about the dress or the face, and then it's also opening this conversation about all the things that I said in the opening on the piece clothes, right? Like where clothing distinguishes you and how it reflects your personality, your class, and your social standing. Um, so when I give you prompts later for writing flash fiction, keep in mind that keeping things open-ended is a really great way to create an entire world in a small space. Um, next one is perhaps my favorite, Excursion into the Mountains. I don't know, I cried, without being heard. I do not know. If nobody comes, then nobody comes. I've done nobody any harm. Nobody's done me any harm. But nobody will help me. A pack of nobodies. Yet that isn't all true. Only that nobody helps me. A pack of nobodies would be rather fine, on the other hand. I'd love to go on an excursion. Why not? With a pack of nobodies. Into the mountains, of course, where else? How these nobodies jostle each other. All these lifted arms linked together, these numberless feet treading so close. Of course, they are all in dress suits. We go so gaily, the wind blows through us and the gaps in our company. Our throats swell and are free in the mountains. It's a wonder that we don't burst into song. So here you have one of Kafka's biggest um, traits, which is he starts with the idea of nobody, which literally means no body, no person, no one. And he turns that into a character, not just a character, but a whole group, right? He says a whole pack of nobodies. So he starts in reality and then takes it to the fantastic. And in fact, he gives you the opposite meaning of what the word is intended to signify. And that is a really um, interesting way to talk about nobody and yet to talk about everybody at the same time. And so that goes back into what I was saying about clothes where leaving things up to interpretation and creating as big of a world as possible really does a lot to make this form um, stand out. Okay, um, in the next piece, re Rejection, um, this is a great example of um, another prompt that you can do when you sit down to write your flash fiction. He begins by just giving you a scenario. When I meet a pretty girl and beg her, be so good as to come with me, and she walks past without a word, this is what she means to say. And then the whole rest of the flash fiction is an exchange, an imagined exchange between these two character, characters. So something you can do is um, begin with that same thing. When I do something, when I meet someone, and then imagine what the exchange might be between those two people. And of course, what's interesting about it too is because he's making it up, we don't know if she actually really would have rejected him, right? This is all his assumptions about not only her and what she would, re how she would react, but it's assumptions about himself. Would he be able to capture the attention of a pretty young woman that's passing by the street? He would think no. 
So that would be an interesting thing to play with um, in your own uh, piece of writing. Um, okay, let's talk about um, the tradesmen. Um, and I'll just say quickly, the street window is just like similar to some of the other ones where it's a snapshot of an experience. So um, that's another way to approach a writing prompt for flash fiction, just capturing a, a single moment um, with lots of details and in a way that makes the reader think. So in The Tradesman, we see that it is a, um, where are we? Um, So this is like a whole exchange between um, a business keeper and, you know, all the things that he comes in contact throughout the day. So in this way, it's like a snapshot of the working man's day. And think back again to what I was saying in the beginning about Kafka and how he, um, you know, he was a hardworking man living in a time where all of a sudden you have the daily activities that used to be explained by faith that are now not being explained by anything. Um, value has now changed. Uh, and here he has a really interesting line in the third paragraph. My money is in the hands of strangers. So he found a very unique way of saying that my livelihood depends on other people being a patron at my business, you know, but instead he says my money is in the hands of strangers. So it's tying him to other people and showing the interconnectedness of everybody um, as, a, as a sort of value um, to explain himself and explain his own status in the community. Um, and then, you know, he has this whole um, narration of going from the business and then going home and what he meets when he gets there. And um, he has that really uh, beautiful line at the end. He says, um, fly then, let your wings, which I have never seen, carry you into the village hollow or as far as Paris, if that's where you want to go. But enjoy yourselves there looking out of the window. See the processions converging out of three streets at once not giving way to each other, but marching through each other and leaving the open space free again as their last ranks draw off. Wave your handkerchiefs. Be indignant. Be moved. Acclaim the beautiful lady who drives past. And then he keeps on uh, with this style of giving commands. Um, and what's interesting, too, is that, you know, it starts off looking like a conversation between people, but then... You know, he says at the beginning, but I am alone in the lift immediately and on my knees gaze into the narrow looking glass. So it's almost like he's speaking to himself. Um, so this is another example of the way that he begins in reality by showing something that looks like a conversation and then takes it into this level of the fantastic. Is he speaking to somebody or is he speaking to his own reflection or is he speaking to no one? And um, what does it mean then to have all of these commands? Um, you see, again, he has an, this now being another, I think, the second reference to looking out the window. And in fact, the next piece, absent-minded window gazing, right? So a third prompt that you can take for consideration is um, a scene that you view as a voyeur. And by that, I mean you are not an active participant. In fact, it's almost like a voyeur is like someone who's peeping, right? So not only are you absent from the interaction, but you are not seen. So your gaze doesn't affect what's happening. So looking out the window, maybe if you are, um, you know, like at a restaurant and you're people watching, or if you see something from afar, that can be a really cool way to have a piece of short fiction and incorporate interesting dialogue as well. It's like when you're um, people watching or when you overhear conversations, right? That fly on the wall kind of um, mentality. Which takes us to the next piece, absent-minded window gazing. What are we to do with these spring days that are now fast coming on? Early this morning, the sky was gray, but if you go to the window now, you're surprised and lean your cheek against the latch of the casement. The sun is already setting. 
but down below you see it lighting up the face of the little girl who strolls along looking about her. And at the same time you see her eclipsed by the shadow of the man behind overtaking her. And then the man has passed by and the little girl's face is quite bright. Um, I actually originally read this piece in a different translation and I think that translation um, really left this line more up into interpretation. So it's the next to last line where he says, at the same time you see her eclipsed by the shadow of the man behind overtaking her. So notice with the language, by saying that a man is overtaking her, it almost sounds like a man is physically taking this woman. And then you have that tension between perhaps an act of violence and then the final line, and then the man has passed by and the little girl's face is quite bright. Um, so when you think about, again, leaving things up to interpretation in an effective piece of flash fiction, um, using words or phrases that leave room for ambiguity work really well. And leaving the reader, at least it's something that Kafka does a lot, as you can see, leaving the reader to be the person who interprets what has happened, not guiding the reader by the hand and saying, all right, this happened, then this happened. But no, just creating a scene, painting a picture, leaving an image that speaks to the reader and that perhaps can change how they interpret the piece over time. And that's kind of what I was talking about um, a couple of weeks ago with the six word short story. Um, What's amazing about that piece of flash fiction, you know, Ernest Hemingway's um, baby shoes, for sale baby shoes never worn, right? It's powerful because it's tragic, but then also there are almost no details there. So the reader or the listener is the one who fills in the blanks. And that's why that piece has not only, you know, survived the decades, it's also spurned, you know, other people to do the same thing. and. It's something that because it's ambiguous, it leaves the mind open to wonder. And that is really the thing that we're trying to do in an effective piece of creative writing, to get the reader to wonder. Um, okay, and then just to finish up, um, we have three more. So the married couple is really interesting because um, you know, it starts just with that same idea of the businessman who doesn't want to work but still has to kind of go through the motions of the everyday man's, you know, plight um, to survive. And here he is having to go on a house call. Um, and the most interesting part of this story um, for me is, um, well, there are two things. The first one I want to say is on page 453. Um, the paragraph that starts, now at last, it seemed to me, my moment had come, or rather, it had not come, and probably would never come. So in the same breath, he is saying, my time had come, but then he's realizing that there never is a right time to talk to somebody who is grieving, or to talk to somebody who, you know, this other character it, that the person that he's making the house call on, he is um, sitting at the foot of the bed of his son who's very sick, right? So when he says my time has come, he's saying that he's built up the courage to do the thing that is uncomfortable, to speak to somebody when there never will be a right time. And again, that plays into a very Kafka-esque characteristic where it's paradox, right? It's like, both things are opposites, but they're also true at the same time. And that lends itself to that idea of realism going into the fantastic. The other part of the story that I find just so incredible is when you have the old man who's leaning forward in his chair, and then he gets pushed back, and the narrator touches his hand, and it's he says, cold as a fish. And at that point, you have a very interesting... Um, you know, tragic event that happens. It almost seems as if he's dead, and that's what the narrator thinks. But then we learn when the wife comes in that he's awake, and he, he had just fallen asleep, actually, um, and he's awake when she enters. And so here you have that same idea of 
um, you know, that is just the way that he falls asleep, and yet it's such a such a tense moment and a very confusing moment that the um, the narrator realizes his business there is not going to take place. It is therefore over, and then he has to leave, right? So um, for a fourth prompt, you can imagine having um, a narrator who has a goal. He has something that he set himself out to accomplish, and either he does accomplish it or he um, doesn't, you know? And is there any way that you can add surprises along the way? All right. And then lastly, um, Give It Up and On Parables are good examples of how you can use an exchange as your um, piece of flash fiction. So for a fifth prompt I, would prompt, I would ask you to just narrate a short conversation or even just a short idea. You know, Give It Up is about a man who is basically asking for directions and gets a very um, strange reply from the policeman, you know, he says, instead of looking for what you're, what you seek, give it up, right? So here the reality is that he's asking for questions, but if we're thinking of Kafka in the context of a society of people who have lost direction and the policeman who is standing in for, um, you know, like a structured piece of society, telling him to give it up, it's not just about directions of where he's looking to go, it's about direction in life. And in this short paragraph, he's been able to really um, showcase the anxieties of the early 20th century, where values have now shifted. They've shifted away from something, but we it's very unclear as to what they've shifted into. And then finally, on parables, he spends one paragraph giving a short exploration of what a parable means, right? He says, um, many complain that the words of the wise are always merely parables and of no use in daily life, which is the only life we have. Finally, he says, all these parables really set out to say merely that the incomprehensible is incomprehensible. So it's like the wise are using parables as a way to think about things that can't be understood, but they themselves are misunderstood as well. So it's almost like this Sisyphean task, right? And by that I mean you're spending all this time to accomplish something that'll never be accomplished. And then he follows that up just with two men who are then talking about this idea, right? Um, why such reluctance? If you only followed the parables, you yourselves would become parables, and with that, rid of all your daily cares. So he says, if we just, you know, focus on parables, focus on stories and high-minded ideals, and that's what becomes who we are, then we don't have to wor worry about daily life anymore. As if we can somehow ascend above the daily struggles. Um, another said, I bet that is also a parable. So this idea of becoming a parable is itself a parable, um, a false explanation. The first said, you have won. The second said, but unfortunately, only in parable. The first said, no, in reality, in parable, you have lost. So this end is really kind of confusing, <laughs> especially if this is your first read of Kafka and of this piece. Um, so I'd be really interested to hear what you think it means and what significance it holds to you. As a hint I'd like to offer, what is something that we do with reality? We look for answers. We look for explanations to things that don't make sense to us, right? And if we're making a parable out of it, and that's a false explanation, that means that we are coming to terms with the fact that we will never find a perfect explanation. So if that person who is trying to make sense of it and says, oh, well, that's a parable, um, you know, he's made sense of what a parable is or what a wise person is doing, that means he's kind of one in reality because he's found a fixed answer to something that can't be answered. In parable, you have lost. So what does that last part mean? Um, I'd love to hear your answers in the discussion board. Thanks for watching. If you have any questions about any of Kafka's pieces or about the prompts, um, I'll be putting a list of prompts in writing on Blackboard so you have those and the explanations are earlier in this video. And um, yeah, 
See you soon.